This week on the show. We're exploring the food scene in Ireland's West Cork. Bon appetit. Skibbery. Thank you. Mm. Oh. Oh. Kayaking Britain's coastline in all conditions. And I get a deeply personal tour of Sarajevo's still visible war wounds. The hairs on my arms just shot up. I don't know what to say. I've never seen anything like this before. We start this week in Ireland. The country is marking 170 years since the Great Hunger, a famine that swept across the country, leading to the deaths of over a million people. But Ireland has since undergone a food revolution, and Kate Hardy Buckley is returning home ahead of the Taste of West Cork Food Festival to explore what was once the epicenter of the famine, and is now the country's top foodie destination. Welcome to West Cork. This is the Mizzen Peninsula, the most southwesterly tip of the island of Ireland. I've been coming to this part of the world since I was eight years old. People are drawn here by the dramatic scenery, the arts, and the great crack. And now, they're flocking here for the local cuisine. West Cork was recently voted Ireland's food capital. The history of the area is as rich and diverse as its food. Along the coast, you'll find caves where pirates smuggled their treasures. It's where Marconi sent the first transatlantic radio transmission to America. And it was here the first famine death was recorded, the first of over a million across Ireland, with a further two million people emigrating. So this is the Skibbereen Saturday Market. At the height of summer, I think maybe the best market anywhere in the country. This is the freshest mozzarella available in Ireland right now. Mm. It's, it's like lactic poetry. April makes the most astonishing potions. Slancha. Slancha. When we think vinegars, we think it's something that's harsh and ag that's aggressive, and that's gentle. Obviously, I can taste the apple. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But there's like a berry taste to it or something like that. Maybe even the whiskey. You'll taste whiskey. the whiskey there. <laughs> 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 a bit early for the whiskey. Yeah. The Skibbereen market continues to slowly but organically grow and get better. People, I think, are, are really realizing more and more that the essence of a real experience is when it's grounded in local foods. And that's what you want, whether you're in Bangkok or Tuscany or in West Cork. Here we go. Bon Skibbereen. Thank you. Mm. Oh. Oh. Wow. It's a real West Cork burger. I've come to meet the Fergusons, who run Gabine, one of the original Irish cheese farm houses here. And they play a huge role on the West Cork food scene. Jaina and her family have been making their award-winning cheese for the last 40 years. And is this sort of where you begin creating the flavours and the texture? In a way, although I think the real start of the story is the soil. And of course, the big flavour is once the cheeses are made and they start to ferment. This is heavier than you'd think. Oh my goodness. Smells are incredible. <laughs> there you are, the finished products. I think if you're in New York or if you're in Paris or wherever we export to, and you come across this, what are you going to feel or smell? West Cork. That's what I love about this. Jaina's children are the latest generation working the land. Fingal makes the charcuteries with over 100 different products. 
The Fergusons and other West Cork food makers account for 75% of artisan producers across the country. In West Cork, not only do you get to taste great food, but you also get the chance to find and explore new ingredients. It's beautiful down here. Here we go. Jim and Maria Kennedy run sea kayaking trips all along the coast where you get to forage for your own food. Out on the Atlantic, looking for dinner. And we don't have to look far. When you start to investigate, they become like friends. You just see, oh, there, look, there's the ore weed coming up. And over here, the sea spaghetti, it's, it's absolutely amazing. For Ireland's coastal communities, seaweed has long been a staple food. It has everything you need. It has minerals, it has vitamins, all the B vitamins that we've spent, you know, 20, 30 euros buying across the shelf. It's all in here. There's a seal over there, also looking for his dinner. Hello, buddy. So what is on my seaweed board? We have some dillisk or dulse, carrageen, another traditional favorite. We have seagrass, beautiful green, also known as spirulina. I recognize that mm -hmm. one. And then for something completely different, the queen of all seaweeds, or maybe the king, pepper dulse, the truffle of the sea. That's extraordinary. Mm. Peppery, such a bite to it, such a kick. What's most striking is the diversity under the kayak. Different shapes, forms, textures, colors. It's quite extraordinary. Even in the famine, people ate seaweed, but I think then it was, it became associated with poverty and hunger. And now people are beginning to rediscover the amazing properties of seaweed. The people of West Cork are also exploring their past this summer in a special remembrance festival of the Irish famine. Various artists are gathering for the Coming Home Art and the Great Hunger exhibition. Tonight, they're performing at an old famine workhouse in Skibbereen. It's been a great adventure exploring the West Cork food scene, but it makes tonight all the more poignant being here on land which was once ground zero of the famine. Three days in Skibbereen, February 1847. Over 400 people have come tonight to hear from the diaries of victims and pay their respects at a famine grave. Despite the success of the food store here, the famine years will always remain part of Ireland's identity. Food that was once in such short supply is now a source of great pride and people all over the world are coming here to savour the tastes of this food revolution. Still to come on The Travel Show. Time, Dogger, Fisher, German Bite. North or Northeast 4 or 5, fog patches, moderate or good, occasionally very poor. The man using an iconic BBC broadcast as inspiration for his incredible journey. And I get a disturbing close-up view of what Sarajevo was like 25 years ago during its terrible siege. So don't go away. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Next up, a man whose passion for the BBC Much Love shipping forecast has inspired him to make the journey of a lifetime. We've been catching up with Toby Carr as he prepares to set off from his home in London. I think one of the really exciting things about going in a kayak on the sea is a sense of simplicity that is about just being very close to the water and it's a a human-powered movement. You can use the environment to your advantage or disadvantage. Mm -hmm. 
I'm Toby Carr and over the next year I'm going to kayak in all of the areas of the shipping forecast. And now the shipping forecast issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. There are warnings of gales in southeast Iceland. High Norwegian Basin 1029, expected 40s 1030 by midnight tonight. The shipping forecast in the UK is the world's first storm warning system. It covers an area from the south coast of Iceland and mid-Atlantic in the west to the Danish coast in the east, right down to the north coast of Africa. Portland, Plymouth, North Biscay. Northerly or northeasterly, four or five. Showers later, good. It's broadcast several times during the day on BBC Radio 4. So it's a pretty big undertaking to paddle in all the areas. The funny thing about the shipping forecast is that I think so few people understand its actual meaning or relevance, but so many people love it and enjoy listening to it. So there's this funny balance between its meaning and its, or its practical meaning and its cultural meaning in a way. South Biscay, variable three or four. The showers. radio was on quite a lot in our house where I grew up, and so in a way it was a bit of a background. So you'd hear this regular rhythm of something being read out. East Seoul, Lundy, Fastnet, Irish Sea. Whilst I was growing up, we had a, um, a small boat on the east coast of England. Because of that, we also grown up listening to the forecast, having a real meaning and uh, trying to understand what it would mean and writing it down. So I've got two days to go. I'm going through all my stuff. It's a bit daunting because I've got to get all of this stuff into a kayak. So I'm just trying to go through what I can take, what I can leave. This is a personal locator beacon. If something goes really badly wrong, this is registered with the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency in Falmouth and it is connected to um, an international rescue system. So you pull up the antenna and you do the thing that you hope you're never going to have to do, which is push the red button here. So push the button and like a whole fleet of helicopters <laughs> turns up or something. I grew up with a rare genetic condition which my brother also had and when we were kids we were often told that we wouldn't live longer than 30 and the life expectancy is quite short. So I think that obviously puts in your mind a sense of determination to try and get the most out of things. You have a sense of freedom. You can get to places that people can't normally get to so there's a remote aspect to it I think which is appealing. There's also a point of perspective I think that being on the water and looking back at the land is quite an interesting way to experience it. Pharaohs, southerly four or five, occasionally six in west, occasional rain in west, mainly good. People have just contacted me from other places and got on board with the project, offered places to stay, offered to plan different bits of the trip, offered to lend me boats or equipment, kind of offers of meals, all sorts of things, and you share a love for doing something. There's a side to it which is also really important to me, which is meeting people in these different places, and, and I think that's what will bring the trip alive. This is it, BBC Travel Show, I'm off. Wish me luck. And that's the end of the shipping forecast. Lying in a Balkan valley and studded with ancient mosques, synagogues and churches, it's fair to say that Bosnia and Herzegovina's stunning capital, Sarajevo, is often unjustly overlooked by tourists. 
walking around the city, it's easy to always be looking up at the bell towers, the cathedrals, the minarets of the mosques, and the beautiful hills. If you do look up, you might miss these, which are down at your feet, and you might not even know what you're looking at unless someone told you. These are called Sarajevo Roses, and they mark the impact site of a fatal artillery shell. A couple years after the war, artists came and filled them in with red resin, and you can see them all over the city. Twenty-five years ago, this was a very different place. Bosnian Serbs sat in the hills and laid siege to Sarajevo as the breakup of Yugoslavia led to nationalism and inter-ethnic violence. 10,000 people died in this city in some of the most horrific fighting Europe's seen in modern times. It's cast a long, distressing shadow, and in an attempt to help me understand what it was like being there back then, I've been sent here, to a hostel in the city center. Hello. Zero One, nice to meet you. Zero One is your name? Yes. It's my father's war code name. And this is the war hostel? Yes, it's just this way. Welcome. Wow. Inside, Zero One attempts to simulate the experience of living in Sarajevo during the siege. It's quite something different, isn't it? It is definitely something different. There are gunfire sounds that never get switched off. Electricity is run from a car battery, the windows are covered, and you sleep on the floor on a rectangle of foam. I am making the stories come alive here trying to make them come alive. Because when you open a book, you have to imagine. Here, you don't need a book. You just need to come and see it and witness it for yourself. Some aspects, you understand? Mm -hmm. Some aspects. For instance, one thing that I would never like to simulate is the fear of losing something, whether that's your life or your family. This is a high-frequency radio. And when there was power, this would be the only connection to the world. Underneath the hostel, there's a collection of relics from the war. Paraphernalia salvaged from Zero One's walks on what used to be the front line. And there's the bunker, a recreation of the front line facility once used by Zero One's father from fighting up in the hills. So what we did is we took my dad's memory and we made it real so that people would understand what, what it was like. Zero One began this project just by running tours which demonstrate how badly damaged the city was during the siege and how the scars still pockmark the city. So this is what happens when you separate people into us and them. The hairs on my arms just shot up. I... Uh... I don't know what to say. I've never seen anything like this before. The district of Grabervitzer is hard hitting enough, but when you go up into the hills, you begin to understand the scale of this problem. This used to be a luxury hotel with superb views. Okay, so this is a sniper hole. Basically a sniper's den, yeah? Shooting from here picking the gun out and just picking some random targets. Well, you can see the whole city from here. I see a lot of windows from here too. We are getting ready for a night in the bunker. Zero One is in here preparing the room for us and he has reinforced the point that it's gonna be quite intense. We can hear the echoing gunshots much louder down here. You can see the smoke already. <sighs> Look at this. Feels quite real.
Not many people choose to sleep down here, as the experience is pretty intense. One of the rules that Zero One has for the bunker is no timekeeping devices. I had to forfeit my watch and my cell phone before he left, so I have no idea what time it is. They left me in here about 11.30 p.m. Maybe it's been an hour. A couple of the sounds that play whenever they sound just jolts me. Well, the night's been a, a blur of pseudo half rest where I'm not really quite asleep, not really quite awake. Okay, well, there's some daylight. Which I guess is a good sign. Don't exactly feel like a fresh daisy right now. But the world seems to be awake. I take my leave of zero one in the morning, but one question has been bothering me overnight. Is this all in good taste? Well, somebody could think that we're playing games or war games or something like that. It's not the point. The point is to just give you a small glimpse of what it was like for people who were forced to live through this, like me and my family. People who were forced to go on the front line, how there was no choice. Well, thank you so much. That was a night I will remember for the rest of my life. <laughs> thank you very really much for staying it. here. Mm. Thank you for picking us. Thanks, everyone. That was a pretty intense experience. Not exactly for everyone, but for me, it was a pretty powerful, actually. Well, that's it for this week. Coming up next week. <laughs> Lucy's in South Africa, meeting the dancers who are challenging the perceptions of Johannesburg's most feared neighborhoods. <laughs> yes! And in the meantime, remember, you can follow our adventures on social media. You can find the links for those on our website. But for now, from me, Mike Corey, and the Travel Show team here in Sarajevo, it's goodbye. <laughs>